der eigentlichen Präsentation. Und ähm, Avi Steinmann von Academic Language Expert wird, ähm, wird dann äh, übernehmen. Ja, Brill ist bekanntermaßen ein niederländischer Wissenschaftsverlag mit einer 340-jährigen Tradition. Und unser Haus ist ähm, sehr international aufgestellt mit äh, globalen äh, Vertriebswerken, wegen und internationalen Netzwerken. Und es gibt neben den niederländischen und deutschen Standorten auch noch Niederlassungen in den Vereinigten Staaten, in Boston und in Singapur. Seit einigen Jahren ist Brill auch im sogenannten Dachmarkt, also in Deutschland, Österreich und der Schweiz, verlegerisch außerordentlich aktiv tätig und äh, seit 2017 gehören die Paderborner Wissenschaftsverlage Schöning, Fink und Mentes zur Brillgruppe und 2021 hat Brill zudem Fankenhoek und Ruprecht in Göttingen und Böhlau in Köln und Wien übernommen. Ja, bei Brill Deutschland äh, publizieren wir Werke in allen geisteswissenschaftlichen Fächern und in allen gängigen Formaten, also Print, Online, äh, E-Books, auf Plattformen äh, geben wir Bücher heraus. Aber einen besonderen Fokus äh, bilden die Theologie, die Judaistik, die Geschichtswissenschaften und die Slavic Studies, die Philosophie, die Altertumswissenschaften und die Kunstgeschichte. Insgesamt ähm, sind es etwa 800 bis 900 äh, Veröffentlichungen, ähm, die wir pro Jahr herausbringen. Und den größten Teil unserer Werke veröffentlichen wir auf Deutsch und auf Englisch, wobei der Anteil der englischsprachigen Veröffentlichungen auch von deutschsprachigen Autoren in den letzten Jahren stark zugenommen hat. Aber wir nehmen auch französischsprachige, spanischsprachige und italienischsprachige Werke ins Programm. Ja, und genau die Frage, wie ähm, Sie als deutschsprachige Wissenschaftler ähm, Ihre Forschungen äh, eng auf Englisch, in eng, mit Hilfe von englischsprachigen Veröffentlichungen ähm, international sichtbar machen können und wie wir ihnen dabei helfen können. Das soll ja das Thema des heutigen Vormittags sein. Erlauben Sie mir aber zuvor noch ein paar Worte zu sagen zum theologischen äh, Programm von Rill Schöning, äh, das ich als Lektorin vertrete. Ähm, traditionell liegt der Fokus ähm, in der Theologie bei Brill Schöning auf, Wissen, auf der wissenschaftlichen katholischen Theologie. Schwerpunkt des Programms sind Kirchen- und Religionsgeschichte, die Bildtheologie, die Dogmatik, die christliche Sozialethik sowie die, das Kirchen- und Religionsrecht. In letzter Zeit herrscht aber auch bei uns eine große Offenheit gegenüber ähm, übergreifenden religionswissenschaftlichen Fragen und auch öko ökumenischen Fragen. Ähm, auch gibt es eine äh, zunehmende Zahl von Veröffentlichungen im Bereich der komparativen Theologie und äh, insbesondere zum ähm, Dialog zwischen Judentum, Christentum und Islam. Ja, soweit kurz zur Theologie. An dieser Stelle möchte ich gerne an meinen äh, Kollegen Dr. Dieter Sawitzki übergeben. Er ist Lektor für die Bereiche Geschichtswissenschaft und Slavic Studies bei uns im Hause. Bitte, Dieter. Yes. Uh, hello, good morning. I'm not quite sure which language to choose, but I see there is a number of um, uh, international names on the list. And so um, to, to balance this, I think I'll try to, to do it in English. Now, as you heard, um, um, my responsibility is um, the list for history and for Slavic and Eurasian studies, as this is called. 
in a way, this is um, a program which combines the traditional Ferdinand Schoening history program in German, plus a growing number of um, titles in English. Mostly these English titles are concentrating on historical topics um, concerning Central, Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe, including Russia and the former Soviet Union, um, Eurasian studies means uh, basically those countries which used to belong to the Soviet Union in Central Asia, uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, uh, uh, etc. Yeah, um, the program is by now about two thirds German, one third English. And um, we have already a number of uh, book series which are open to English and German publications and a lot of um, series which are for English publications only. And um, yeah, um, you uh, will um, get an idea of the profile if you uh, go on brief.com or schoening.te and uh, type in those topics which are interested for you as researchers in the field and you'll see what we are doing traditionally. It's much um, about the history of Poland, the Baltic countries, um, uh, yeah, and um, German and Central European history from the 19th and 20th centuries and a bit of early modern history. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Detailed. It's, um, it's, it's always nice to share a, uh, a, a panel with, uh, with both of you, um, both you and Martina. And I thank you for your participation um, today. Um, I too will speak in English. Um, I have a tendency to speak quite quickly. So if, if there's anything that you don't understand, um, please do stop me uh, and I will be happy to explain it again. Um, so good morning to everyone. My name is Avi Stamen. I am the founder and CEO of Academic Language Experts. Academic Language Experts is a company that is dedicated to helping academic scholars publish their research in the humanities and social sciences. Um, so we help with uh, book uh, translation, editing, proofreading. We also help with putting together a strong book proposal so that Martina will look favorably upon your, uh, upon your proposal and your prospectus. We also help with indexing um, and anything that has to do with the with a books or journal articles. Um, in addition, we also help with grant proposals. So if you ever need any help, whether it's language or scientific support, uh, when it comes to books, articles, or uh, or grants, please don't hesitate to be in touch. Okay, that is enough background. I think we can now jump straight in uh, to uh, the main presentation today. And what we'll be discussing, and uh, let me just get it up here on my screen, thank you. Uh, what we'll be discussing today is how do you successfully publish your manuscript in English? Now, out of uh, curiosity, if I could see a show of hands, how many of you uh, have published a book in English in the past? Okay, so it looks like, uh, looks like we've got only a handful who have already published a book in English. How many of you have published an article in English in the past? Raise the hands. Okay, so so I think this will be very relevant to you. Um, and I don't need to tell you that that obviously as you uh, progress in your academic career and as you uh, as you make progress, um, you know, obviously it's great to publish in German. I always encourage scholars to publish in their native language and especially in German where there's such a rich history of academic publishing, but I think that we all know that it's important to share our ideas in English, whereby there will be a much larger audience um, who will be able to engage with us, and that will help us further our career. So today we're going to talk about how to go about doing that, specifically in the context of books. How do you get your first book published in English? Um, there will also be time for questions and answers. You're also welcome to um, uh, to, to ask any questions on the chat, and I'm glad to see that we are joined today not only by wonderful researchers, but by a lovely cat um, as well. So <laughs> uh, hopefully uh, he or she will also enjoy the presentation. Okay, so the first question I want to uh, raise today is how do you choose a publisher? And you might be thinking, well, isn't that the last step that I should be doing, choosing a publisher? Don't I need to do my research first, write it up, um, have it ready, and then I look for a publisher? And the answer is no. 
Um, the answer is, is that thinking about where you're going to publish should happen at a very early stage in your research. And why is that so important? And I would say for two reasons. First of all is you are going to, it will help you to write your text if you know where you're writing it to. We all tell our students when you're writing, make sure you have an audience in mind, make sure you know who you're writing to. Different publishers have different styles, uh, publish uh, works of different lengths. And the more you can, you know how to mimic or how to copy or how to be similar in writing to other books that have been um, published in your field and you know, okay, I'm going to publish with Brill. I know Brill wants between 75,000 and 100,000 words. I know they're gonna want chapters, you know, a certain number of chapters. It helps you to organize yourself to publish. That's reason number one. Reason number two is because publishers and acquisitions editors, who are the people who are in charge of deciding whether your book is going to get published, they want to know about your ideas at an early stage. They don't want to wait until you're finished because, and why is this? Because they want to help. They want to tell you, okay, you know your research. You're the expert in that. But I know what sells as a book. I know what people are going to be interested in reading. I know what is going to attract bookstores to want to buy your book. And that's really, really valuable and important advice. So if you do it at the very end and they go back to you and say, well, actually, you need to change all these things, you're going to be very frustrated because you're going to say, I've already written my book. I can't rewrite it now. But if you come to them in an early stage and get feedback and get input and get their ideas and think together, you will be much, much better off in the long run. Okay. So now how do we actually choose a publisher? First and foremost, I want to raise a question which is related but different. How do I know if my work should be a book or an article, right? And I'm sure many of you have had this question before. I've got my research. It's interesting. I don't know whether I should be publishing it as an article, as a book, maybe a few articles versus a book. And I think that the main question you need to ask yourself when it comes to this question is two main questions. Number one is, if it's a book, who is going to care about it? Okay, if you're writing an article, it's okay if there's a small audience that reads that article as long as they subscribe to the journal and are following your work. If you're writing a book, there needs to be an audience beyond just the 10, 15, 20 members of your specific field who are going to be interested, who are going to want to buy the book, who are going to be engaged. So ask yourself the question, who is going to care beyond my small particular field? Number two, the second question you need to ask yourself is, do I have an idea that I can build out over the course of a long um, uh, a book, meaning the fact that you wrote your thesis and it's 250 pages doesn't mean it's right for a book. If there's one idea that goes throughout, there's one, um, let's call it a spine of the book or one central theme that you build out over time, you make an argument, but it takes different ideas to get to your bottom line, then yes, a book is a very good idea. If your thesis is more a collection of chapters, right, and each chapter stands on its own, you may want to consider publishing a series of articles and not publishing a book because there's not necessarily an added value in publishing it all together because each one is its own independent idea. So think about your own research and think to yourself, well, is there one idea that I would not be able to make this argument in 10,000 words? I need 75,000 words to make this argument. If you can make the argument in, in, in 10,000 words or in 5,000 words, then do it. There's no one, no one enjoys reading a book that goes around in circles and makes the same idea and same point over and over again. The second question you're going to want to ask yourself is, should I publish in a trade press or should I publish in a university press? Now, I want to explain the difference between the two. And there are all sorts of different trade presses and there are all sorts of different university presses. University presses are generally um, publishers that are uh, connected to a particular university. So Amsterdam University Press. Oxford University Press, Harvard University Press, those are examples of uh, university presses. Uh, whereas a trade press is, are presses like Brill and De Gruyter and more Zeebeck. Those are presses where you are going to, they, they are for-profit um, uh, entities and you are going to, uh, to try and commission them to, to publish your book. Now, I wanna be clear, there is not a, a preference in terms of quality. Um, Brill does great work, Oxford does great work, Princeton does great work. There, there, there are, there are good. There is good research being being um, published in all of the different types of presses. Um, what, what it, it may impact is it may impact the number one question I think, which is going to be important to you as researchers, is not how much money I'm going to make on my book because most likely you will not make that much money on your book, but rather 
how will it make an impact? How will, where will readers find it? Okay. And if the answer is, well, actually in my field, it's very common for people to publish with X publisher. So then that should be a consideration of yours. That should be something that you're thinking about. The fact that your book is published with Harvard, but no one in your field is aware of it doesn't help you very much. So it's really important to kind of Look at your own bibliography. This is a tip that I often give to people. Look at your own bibliography and ask yourself the question. From the year 2019, let's say, okay, until the year 2023, until today, the last four years, who is publishing in my field? And as soon as you answer that question, you're going to be able to, to get a better answer as to whether or not um, it's relevant to you. Now, the other thing I would say about Brill, and, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Ditard or, um, uh, or Martina, is one of the things that I think I, I appreciate about Brill is that Brill is not afraid to publish very niche topics. So if you're saying to yourself, well, my topic, I don't know if there's going to be thousands of, of, of copies sold because it's very particular and it's very specialized. Um, Brill does a really nice job of, of publishing um, really important work uh, that that may not get published otherwise, that may not be the most popular, right? They're, they haven't fallen, a lot, of, a lot of presses have fallen into this trap where they, almost all of their books kind of become intended for a very popular audience. And then you have to write in a very different writing style. If you have very important research and you want to keep it as important research, um, then I think it's really valuable to consider uh, publishers that really specialize in your area. Dita, did I, did I, did I say that right? Did, anything I said? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I would like to add, of course, um, the more specialized the topic is, the more important it is to place it in an established book series um, because um, a, a specialized topic needs the environment of a well-established se uh, series to become visible. Therefore, I would always recommend um, search at first our website, go to your library and check out which book series might be um, a fitting environment for your uh, quite special uh, topic. And if you have already series in mind, please mention them when you approach us as uh, publishers, because then um, we uh, can check out and contact the series editors with a proposal. And of course, uh, there's peer reviewing, there is um, a decision of the series editors necessary, um, but um, uh, you're making your, your life uh, as an academic publisher uh, author easier, the more focused you are in, in in your idea where to publish. It's yeah. no use to to send a specialized proposal and just I would like to to publish this with Brill. Can you help me? Because then um, we are not sure where to put this ideally. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We're we're going to talk about finding a series in a few minutes. So that's that's really helpful. Um, the next component that I think you should think about is purchase price. How much is it going to cost for uh, uh, for readers to be able to purchase it. Now, it depend depending on the context. You know, oftentimes it will be libraries that will be publishing it, and then and then it's less important exactly how much it costs because it's as long as people have access. But for example, if you want to uh, have your book used as a textbook, let's say that students will be reading as part of their curriculum, that's going to be something you're going to want to pay attention to um, and make sure that it's going to be uh, reasonable and affordable, or that they'll have some sort of access. You may want to consider open access, which we can talk about a little bit. Um, the next question you're going to want to ask, and we kind of touched on this before, is do you want this to be more for a popular audience, in which case you need to expand the potential readership of who's going to be interested? By the way, I see a lot of people taking notes, and I very much appreciate that. Um, it means that that hopefully you're finding value in this. I will send the recording around, so you'll be able to rewatch this afterwards. I'm sorry I didn't say that at the beginning. Um, so you're going to have to think about whether you want a popular audience, in which case the ideas are going to need to be more broad. You're going to need to think about well, how would this interest someone who is intellectual, who's curious, but isn't an expert in, you know, 14th century Sp Spanish handwriting, right? If that's my topic, I need to think about, well, how am I going to interest people in 15th century, in 13th century? How am I going to interest students who um, are really fascinated by this topic, but may not understand all the very technical details about what it is that I'm writing about? So maybe I want to write a little bit less methodology and a little bit more narrative, you know, thinking about those questions. Um, now, avoiding predatory presses, okay? And I wanna, I wanna talk about, this is an important point, is that 
be very, no matter what you do, no matter what direction you want to go in with your book, you want to be very careful that you're not sending to a predatory press. Now, how do we define predatory presses is a complicated question, but in very simple terms, it means it's a press that is not really doing much peer review, if any. It means a press that is not doing much editorial work, if any. It means a press that uh, oftentimes they will invite you and say, oh, we found your research online, but really it's spam. Really, they're not, you know, all, they're really not that interested. They just want to make money. And usually it's a press that will ask you for money up front. Um, now, that doesn't mean any of those things. There could be a legitimate press that asks you for money up front, but you want to be very careful that you're not publishing in a place um, that's, you know, that's, that's sort of uh, sketchy or that isn't going to give you academic credit. It's really, you're going to waste your entire manuscript. Now, there are questions, there are sort of, there's the very reputable presses, right? The Brills, the DeGrotes, the NYU, Princeton, Oxford, Cambridge. Then there are the presses that are the predatory. And then there's a middle category. Okay, the middle category is what I call van, what, what's known as vanity presses. Vanity presses do some form of academic um, review, something, but it's not very rigorous and they accept almost everything that's submitted to them. And those are presses that are really set up as for-profit entities. Um, and while it may be okay to publish there, you have to think about long-term ramifications. When you, if you're planning on, you know, building an academic career and you're going to have, you know, your promotion committee and they're going to be looking at your publications, you're not going to want them to say, oh, that press, that means it's not a serious project and forget it, right? You're going to want to make sure that it's reputable, that it has a good name. So, you know, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to get into questions of which press is a vanity press and which press is predatory. Those are questions that you can find a lot of chatter and talk on online. So you can always Google your press and ask for reputation or ask your colleagues, um, but it's just something to be aware of. And finally, um, you know, you're going to want to think, and this, this I just mentioned now, is you're going to think about how will people perceive publishing in this press, right? How are your colleagues going to perceive it? How is it going to affect your potential career opportunities, both now and down the line? You need to, especially if you're at the beginning of your career, you need to strike a balance on the one hand to publish efficiently and effectively, right? Because sometimes some publishers will take four or five, six years until your book comes out. That doesn't help you, right? You need to get a job next year, not in four or five years. Um, on the other hand, you don't want a press that's just going to put it out overnight and not do the serious work that goes into creating a book, which is serious and it's complicated and it includes peer review and design and proofing. And, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into creating and developing and, and publishing a manuscript. So you want a publisher that's going to take that seriously. Okay, um, this is exactly what Dieter uh, talked about first. My rec re recommendation, aside from trying to find a publisher that's interesting, is look for a series, okay? A series is a collection of books in a particular topic um, that there's a theme to it, right? So it might be, I don't know, ancient archaeology, archaeology in the mid in the Mideast, um, you know, or it might be, um, you know, studies in 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 um, in fifteenth century history in um, in in Italy. Whatever it is, you're going to want to find a you know kind of good partners. So the way you perceive your book is your book is an independent entity. But the way an acquisitions editor oftentimes looks at it is says, how does this fit in with all of the other books that I've published previously? So spend some time on the publisher websites and see. Where are my colleagues publishing and where are my advisors publishing? Um, where is the conversation happening? And if I can continue a conversation that already exists and add to it and contribute to it, I'm doing a lot more than publishing something that stands on its own. Uh, on a very pragmatic level, the sales and marketing team in the, in the publisher is going to ask themselves, do I know who is going to be interested in buying this book? That's a really important question. I know that as academics, we don't tend to think about our research in a sales context, but it's going to be important when it comes to book publishing is to ask yourself, will they know who the audience is? Is the audience, are they fellow scholars? Are there departments in other, uh, you know, in, in other universities that are similar that might be interested? Are students interested? Um, is this going to be interesting to a general audience? Maybe there's an association that I'm a member of. I'm a member of a, the American Historical Association, and they might be interested all of these things are going to help the publisher make a decision about whether it's appropriate for them or not. Um, there's a really great subject area grid, which I love, which I which I put in the link to uh, here at the bottom. Um, it might not be clickable. So Alana, if you're here, if you don't mind um, just sharing that in the chat. Um, but 
the, the, the basically gives a breakdown of which publishers are interested in which fields. Um, but it's important for me to emphasize this is only for some university publishers. So it does not include, you know, the brills of the world, which are important not to forget about. So, uh, you know, maybe one day someone will make a subject area grid in those fields as well. But this is a really helpful tool to kind of figure out which publishers might be relevant for your book. All right, the next thing I want to discuss is thinking like an editor. I want to get into the, and when I say editor, I don't mean a language editor, I mean the acquisitions editor, that individual, the gatekeeper, your confidant and colleague who's going to make the decision about whether they want to publish your book or not. And if there's one thing you come out of the conversation today um, with, it's the idea that the, the acquisitions editor try to be, build a relationship with them in a real and genuine way. They're interested in helping, they're interested, they're very busy, they're not always going to have time. They're not always going to be able to sit back and have a two-hour coffee break with you. But the the more you involve them, um, the better it is. So so and, the, and like we said before, the acquisitions editor is going to ask themselves: Is there going to be an audience that's going to buy the book? I think we would all agree that all the time and effort and money and you know that's being put into publishing a book. If the whole if only twenty people are going to read it, and the whole point is just to get career promotion. Well, then the, the system is broken, right? There's something that needs to be fixed because we publish books in order for people to read them. So now I want to talk for a minute for those who have done a dissertation or a thesis but have not yet published a book and talk about what the difference is. Because the most common error and issue that I see is people who try to just take their dissertation and force it into a book and it doesn't, it almost never works. So what's the biggest difference? The dissertation is you need to come up with a very with a novel idea. And you need to show and demonstrate that you're able to do the rigorous research that is required in order to make that idea plausible. But really, you're trying to impress three people. You're trying to impress your promote, you know, your, your advisory committee, your advisor. And so long as they are okay with your research, it's good to go. A book is entirely different. A book, you need to ask yourself the question, who cares? And why is that question so important? Because it will impact who, how you build your research. So let me give you a few examples. Um, dissertations are usually full, full, full of very, very heavy literature reviews. Okay, we need to demonstrate and prove that we have covered every last part of, you know, of of our research area and research field, and we know what to do with it. Um, but uh, a book, most uh, most readers are not going to want to see that level of detail when it comes to literature review. Of course, they're going to want to understand how your idea contributes and adds to the existing literature. But they're not going to want to read through the history of everyone who's always who's ever talked about this topic. And I've seen books published where this is done, where it takes me 40 pages just to get to what your idea is. I bought your book for you. I didn't buy your book for all of the other people that have come before you. So talk about them in a very concrete and, and, and succinct, short way. Um, and then get to your your novelty, get to your idea, get to your your creativity, what you're adding to the conversation. There is an assumption if you're publishing a book that you know the 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 previous literature. You don't need to demonstrate that through 40 pages. The other thing that I would talk about is methodology. Talk about methodology quite quickly and to the point. Don't go into very long and complicated descriptions about a particular manuscript. Um, you know uh, uh, how you were able to decipher or or Talk about it as it interests the reader, but don't talk about all of the different chemicals in you know law in great detail about how you got you know to to do that because I think people may get bored or turned off. Um, so that's in terms of of the differences. Now um, I recommend making a list of three to five publishers to start off with. Okay, you don't need to necessarily uh, um, you know um, you don't need to necessarily start with with uh, you know. With 20 publishers, you also don't have to start with one. I mean, what I mean by that is uh, that you're, you, you, as opposed to a journal article where you have to uh, uh, um, uh, submit to one place and then you're not allowed to submit anywhere else, a book you can submit to a few different places. Now, once your book is sent off for review, so let's say you submit to Braille, they're interested, they send it off for review, it is it is accepted practice not to then go and try and send it to other places for review because reviewers are taking the time to read through your, your proposal. Um, but in the meantime, you can submit to a few different places. Um, so that's really important. Um, I want to take a quick pause here uh, just to uh, open up the floor if anyone does have any questions or comments. Um, and then we'll we'll continue in a minute. 
Um, I see here Ludmila um, says in Germany, publishing one's thesis is mandatory for graduating, so the dissertation needs to become a book within a year. Yes, that's that is correct. I, I'm familiar with that. We've worked on on some of those projects, um, and that's really hard. <laughs> I mean, that's really really not easy to do that because of all the work that needs to go into turning a dissertation into a book. Um, so I'm not saying that a dissertation could not be a book. It definitely should become a book if it's appropriate. But but what I am saying is, is that you need to think about your audience and you need to think about who's going to be interested in reading it um, and not just are you proving your points to your advisors? That's that's the main idea. So it could be that if you know you're going to have to do that, you might want to work in parallel. You might want to work on kind of a book version and a thesis uh, version. Uh, does anyone have, uh, does anyone have uh, any questions or comments to this point that you wanted to share or anything that wasn't clear from anything that I've said? Feel free to open up your microphone or you can write in the chat. Either way is perfectly fine. In the meantime, um, Alana, if you're here, um, if you don't mind uh, putting on, uh, 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 sharing in the chat the infographic, that would be, that would be really great. Yes, I'm sharing one second. Okay, great, fantastic. All right, if anyone has any questions, you are welcome to, 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 to ask. Um, in the meantime, just quickly before we get back to the session, um, I wanted to share with everyone uh, an infographic that we made um, that really breaks down the process of how to work on your book proposal, uh, to your book submission, to your working on the drafts. And this is something that we tried to make it as simple and straightforward as possible. Uh, so we're going to share that here. I think I actually, I have it myself. So I'm going to share that here in the chat. Maybe we could bring it up on screen just quickly. Um, and I think you'll find that to be a really helpful resource uh, in preparing your book. Oh, Alana already has it up there. So let's just open this up quickly. All right. So you see here that we've got the road to publication. Um, you've got the first stage is pre-submission, identifying your publishers. Oh, sorry about that pop-up. Writing your proposal, uh, proposal review, and publisher outreach. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but this is a really, really helpful tool that we worked on quite, quite at length um, in order to help you understand how the process works. And the other thing that you'll be, that's really helpful about this tool is you can see where we provide ALE, where we provide our services. So where you can get our help if you say, okay, well, I understand the process, but now I want help at this particular point. Um, it, it, it clearly uh, tells you where ALE can help and also where the publisher's responsibilities are in that process. So I encourage everyone, whether it's now or later on, uh, to copy that link, share it, you know, keep it for yourself, and then um, uh, use it at, as appropriate. Okay, moving on with the presentation. All right, so when is it that you're supposed to inquire about your book? And, and I talked about this a little bit before, but the answer is as early as possible. Um, you don't want to wait until the end. It's enough that you have a rough idea. I think that you should have something written out, right? You don't want to just have an idea. That might be a bit too early. But once you have an idea that you've put down on paper, you've shared with a few colleagues, that's enough to then go share with an acquisitions editor. You don't want to waste their time if you're really not ready, but you also don't want to wait until you've written half the book and then they come back and tell you, well, actually what would interest us is a different idea that's maybe related or connected and you just wasted a half a year in writing something that's not going to be relevant. Um, now, that doesn't mean that you should be submitting your entire text. Be very careful about when you inquire, do the initial inquiry, just let the acquisitions editor guide you about what they want to receive. Don't just send them your entire dissertation. There's nothing, they do not have time to read through your entire dissertation. It's not written like a book. They're not gonna be interested in it. So don't waste their time and don't waste yours by sending them your entire dissertation. Ask them what they wanna receive, give them some information, be ready in case they say, I want to see a sample chapter, or I want to see your prospectus or your proposal, which hopefully we'll talk about as well. Be ready to send them something. Don't come totally unprepared, um, but don't don't send them your entire work either. Um, what's important to understand is that the editor, the acquisitions editor, is your advocate. It's not like it's it's a bit different than journals. If if any of you have ever published in a journal, you know that really the peer reviewers right? And re reviewer two, for those who are familiar, have a lot of influence and a lot of, um, you know, uh, their say goes very far in terms of whether a book is published or not. And the desk editor or the, 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 the person who's, who's kind of, you know, fielding the inquiries in the beginning, they have a limited say, they have a limited um, input, they may decide in cases of conflict, but 
they're not making the decision. With books, it's a bit different. The acquisitions editor has a lot of influence over whether something is going to get published or not. So that doesn't mean that it doesn't that the reviewers, the peer reviewers aren't aren't important. They're very important. And if a peer reviewer comes back and says, I would not accept this book, the book is not going to get accepted. However, if let's say you have an acquisitions editor that really be believes in your project, you've worked on it together. Um, they think that it's interesting. And then it goes out to peer review and maybe the peer reviewers, some of them think it's better. Some of them think it's not as great. They may advocate on your behalf. They may, they can be your best, best helper in this process. So your, your number one job is going to be to convince them that it's an interesting idea and, and, and not just convince, but conduct, construct a dialogue with them about what they are interested in. Now, the other thing I would say about this is keep in mind the acquisitions editors will know your field in general, but will most likely not be an expert in your particular subject area. So as opposed to the peer reviewers, who you can really kind of, you know, they in theory really know your field quite well. They're probably someone that you know or someone that you know of. The acquisitions editor is going to be someone who maybe understands uh, you know, classics, but they may not know your particular, you know, uh, uh, linguistic, um, you know, approach to whatever it may be. So, so just be, when you're writing to them, assume that they're smart, don't dumb it down, right? Assume that they're intelligent people, um, but also don't assume that they know the intricate details of your particular field of research. Um, so keep in mind that books are different than journals. Also start a conversation. Don't start it off with a pitch, Right. Start it off with, I have an idea. I have a concept. I, I've written some things out about it. Here's why I think it's new and novel. Would you be able to talk to me about it? Are you interested? Can we can we set a time to speak? Or if you're at a conference, forget about I don't I'm not going to say forget about the presentations of the conference because that's important. But don't ignore the publishers that are sitting in the hall that are there for you. In fact, um, Martina is was joining us. I think she had to run, but she was joining us today from a conference of theology in Berlin uh, that she's at right now, because that's where that's where people are at um, the conferences. So make sure to show up to the conferences um, if you can. Obviously, you know, obviously it's you know it, it, sometimes it's easier said than done. Um, if there are virtual conferences, go there and make sure to engage and to tell them about what you're working on. If you don't tell them what you're working on, there's no way they're going to know what you're working on. Be easy to work with. Okay, acquisitions editors don't find it frustrating to work with scholars who are too set in their ways to be able to accept feedback and, and input. Well, like we said at the beginning of the presentation, the acquisitions editor is wants to um, uh, help you sell your book and wants to help your book get out there and be really successful. If you're not willing to accept their feedback about what makes a book work, then it's going to be a really frustrating process. So make sure you're nice. Make sure you have something original to say, not something that's just repeating what others have said before it. Um, show them that you've read the books in their series, right? If you can come to an acquisitions editor and say, listen, I love your series. You know, I noticed this book and that book and this book I've read. And I think my book is just like fits in beautifully with what you've done previously. That makes the acquisitions editor's life so much easier and so much nicer. So instead of them having to figure out, well, how does this fit in? You've done the hard work for them. So you're going to read those books in your field. So you may as well engage with them in a meaningful way. Um, show that you will help with pushing the book, with, with, with getting the word out after the, after the book is published. That's really important. I know there's an, a sort of feeling of like, well, my job is to write the book and the publisher's job is to, is to distribute it and make sure it gets out there. Um, that's a bit of an old way of thinking about it. Um, publishers want authors that are going to help themselves. So find, think about what your platform, that's the word that's very fancy recently. What is your platform? Meaning what, what I mean by platform is how do you get your ideas out to the world? Not just through publishing an article or publishing a book, but how do you, how do people know who you are, what you do? Is it through social media? Is it through a blog? Is it through a listserv that you're active in? Is it through lecturing at conferences? Don't do all of those things. You'll, you'll fall on your feet, not on your face if you try to do everything. Pick one or two platforms that you say, this is really, I love Twitter because it's easy. A few characters, I just send it out. People know about it. I love, you know, blogging because it gives me a chance to talk about my ideas in a way that's not overly formal and academic. Whatever it is, right? I love lecturing because I love speaking to people about what it is that I do. Whatever it is, make sure that you show the acquisitions editor, I will help you. I want my, I want to succeed. I want you to succeed. I will help you by doing X. I will help you by doing Y. Once the book is out, I'm going to go on a book tour. I know authors who have gone on book tours 
and you know to talk about their book and they go to different universities to talk about the importance of it be sure that you're ready to do that um and 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 come ready to work just because you have an idea and just because you've written your entire thesis or dissertation doesn't mean there isn't going to be more work to do there is going to be more work to do the reviewers are going to have ideas the acquisitions editor is going to have ideas come open and that's why i say come early so that your ideas are formed in part by what's going to be successful Okay, how to reach out. How do you want to reach out to an acquisition center? What's appropriate and what's not appropriate? So you can reach out via email. You can reach out if there's an online form on the website, you can do it. If you're at a conference, approach the acquisition center. Um, my recommendation is do all of those things. You might feel like you're being a bit of a nudge or a bit bothersome, but actually acquisition centers are really busy. So make sure that they see your name and that they remember it. They're like, oh, that was that lovely person I met at the conference. Now I'm following up by email. Okay, I connect that or the opposite. You've sent an email to someone, you know they're going to be at a conference, follow up with them. Be patient. Editors have a lot of submissions. Think about this. They probably get six, seven, eight submissions a week. Multiply that by if they're at the read through the full manuscript, you know, and a manuscript is 200, 250 pages. Um, you know, I'm not sure any of us really can read 1,400 pages a week well. Um, I, at least I could speak for myself and say that I can't do that, right? So be patient with them. They've got a lot on their plate and try to make it as easy for them as possible. Okay. Um, a quick checklist of, uh, so we're going to talk about the book proposal quickly, and that's really important because what goes into this proposal, what should you have ready when you approach a publisher? Okay. So first of all, you're going to want to talk, you're going to want to make sure that, you know, um, if, if the publisher has specific length or specification requirements, you're going to want to make sure that you, that you know that you're going to want to make sure you have engaging content and subject matter and that it's, it's interesting to them. Um, that you have a clearly defined target audience. You say, my audience is our academics that are members of this society and members of these departments. Don't say my target audience are historians because no one knows how to sell to historians. If you say my target audience are historian are medieval historians who uh, with a focus on medicine, well, okay, now I know what you're aiming at. Now, don't be too specific either. If you just say one department and that's it, those are the only people that are going to be interested in the whole world, well, then What's the point of publishing the book? It's too small. So you have to find that right audience. Um, make sure you're, you're updating the status of as you progress during the book. So if you've engaged in this conversation, make sure you're telling them where you're, or, or in the proposal itself, you can say, okay, I have completed one chapter. I've got another chapter in the works. I've got other chapters that I'm going to be working on over the next few months. Um, here's my plan. Here's my timeline. Even send them a timeline. It shows that you're organized, shows that you manage yourself well. It shows that you're, you're going to be on time. Uh, make sure that whatever you're sending adheres to the publisher guidelines. So if the publisher says, I want to see this in a proposal, make sure you send them that and not something else. Um, and finally, um, reviewer suggestions. This is something really important that most academics don't think about. It's really hard to find peer reviewers. And we're not going to talk about that today because it's a different topic, but it's really hard. I, how many times have you been asked to do a review where you've had to turn it down because you don't have time, right? It's hard for publishers to find peer reviewers. If you can recommend, you know, uh, Professor John Smith, he would do a really great job um, with my book. They, they, they can find that very helpful. Some of them will have their own reviewers, but sometimes they won't, and that will be really helpful. Okay, let's talk quickly about a cover letter, okay? Um, what should you do in your letter, in your email, in your opening email to the um, publisher? So introduce yourself the same way you would do in person, very friendly, very professional, very courteous. Make sure you say what you're aiming to do, right? Why are you writing your book? What's the, what's the big thing? What's the big issue that you're trying to tackle? Um, and mention maybe a tentative name for your book if you have an idea for it. That's it. Um, don't start trying to prove to them how important your idea and topic is. They will make a decision about whether they think your topic is important or not. Don't ask annoying questions about how long is it going to take or how much does it cost? Or there will be time for those questions, but don't do that in your opening email. It shows that you're going to be difficult to work with. Um, and also don't make serious writing and language mistakes, right? This is your first impression. Um, as we say in English, you only have one chance to make a first impression. Make sure that it's good. Make sure that it really, um, that you're really kind of, you know, showing your best, your best, um, your best things. Okay, your bio. Um, part of your proposal is going to be a biography talking about yourself. Okay, and most scholars, most researchers, right, will send a CV, a very dry CV. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to send your CV, especially if you have good accomplishments there. What I would recommend and what I've seen done, which I really like, is write it as a story. Why is it, what brought you to the point today to write this book? What experiences do you have? Why is it important to you? Um, 
it's not entirely like a personal reflection, but it can include parts about why this is meaningful, why you're the right person to write this book. Maybe it's a really interesting topic for a book, you know, um, but maybe you're not the right person to, to handle it. Maybe someone else needs to, to be writing this book. So talk about your credentials, what you've done previously. Don't be worried about bragging or showing off. You have to be on, you have to like bring your best characteristics forward and talk about them in a confident way. Not w- without hubris, without being overly egotistical or cocky, but, um, but really talk about your accomplishments. Um, don't talk about how you're going to be, a, this is the most common mistake that's made in, in proposals is people talking about, I'm going to do something totally new that no one's ever seen before. Uh, that is a guarantee you will not get published. And why is that? Because the chances of you doing something entirely new, you know, first of all, that's probably not true. You probably are influenced by previous thought on, in the, on the subject. And B is they're not going to want to sell it. If you're doing something entirely new, well, who's going to be interested? Hard to know. Make sure that it's couched in in existing literature. It's good to be novel. It's good to be creative. It's good to talk about the research gaps and why you're coming to say something new. All that do, but don't come to say, I'm the first and only person who ever thought about this idea or has ever you know, considered this area of research. It makes it really hard for the acquisition center. Um, don't, and don't, don't think about the, the, what you're sending to them in terms of your own bio or your CV. Don't include every single last conference or lecture or, you know, advisory position you have. Think about it within the context of the book. What, which of these positions actually shows my competence um, and my ability in this particular topic? Okay. Um, what is a, now, now, what is a prospectus? A prospectus is, is two or three pages that's part of the proposal, okay, that this is the hardest part uh, for authors to write, in my experience, because it's something you're not used to writing, right? A bio, a bio we can write, a, a sample chapter, we can write. Um, you know, those are things we're used to doing. Um, a prospectus is a little bit different. A prospectus is basically, it's our pitch. It's our, it's our argument to the publisher that this is something that they should take interest in. So what does a prospectus look like? First of all, um, we're gonna, the first thing you're going to want to do is talk about similar titles, similar books that have come in the past. Okay, Talk about them. Engage with them critically. Don't go too far, but talk about what's been published. If you can engage with books that that publisher themselves have published, you really have helped yourself, right? If you could say, Bill published in 2021, this book on XYZ, this is why it's really important. This is what we learned from it, but it misses, it misses A, B, and C, or I'm coming to add to that conversation, or I'm coming to, to, to discuss critically their arguments. Great. You've just created a ongoing discussion um, that's really important. So think about similar titles, but then come to say, what is the gap, right? What's missing? What hasn't been done? And then talk about why you want to fill that gap or how you're going to fill that gap. That's going to be really important. So a critical engagement and discussion with uh, research and literature in your field. The third goal is going to be talking about potential audience. This, we talked about this a little bit before, but I'm going to repeat it. Really important to define really, really well. Who's going to buy this? Which libraries? Um, you know, Which societies? What kind of people? Is it for students or only for researchers? Um, are there museums that might be interested in this? Or, you know, sometimes there are people who follow a specific subject that aren't researchers or academics themselves. All of those folks are potential audience members. Um, and, and, and you'd be surprised where things sell. Sometimes things sell best in a museum. Sometimes they sell best on Amazon. I interviewed the, um, the head of Columbia University Press. She told me their number one selling place for all their academic books is on Amazon. I was like really surprised. I was like, really? Right? Like, what does that mean? Who's buying it on Amazon, right? What kinds of people? Eh, we don't always know, but that's important. And goal number four is the dissemination strategy. How are you going to get this book out to the world? Again, it is the publisher's responsibility to market it and to get it out, but the publisher will do as well as you can help them do. So it's really, really important um, to disseminate, to try and disseminate your books as widely as possible. Um, so anyway, uh, it, yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's move on because I'm I know that we're short on time. If anyone has questions at the end, um, with pleasure. Okay. Other parts that you're going to need to include in your proposal, and again, I, I recommend having these things ready before you start talking to the publisher. Is a sample chapter, one chapter. It doesn't need to be very long. 10, 15 pages is more than enough. Um, your introduction that gives an idea of what your book's about. Um, a detailed table of contents, so kind of every chapter and a paragraph about what that chapter is going to be about, so they get the idea of about the entire book, not just your sample. 
Um, and also if there are any issues with permissions and rights um, to talk about those as well. So if it's, you know, you're gonna need to get permissions for images or old manuscripts or, you know, whatever it may be, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you clarify that already in the proposal. Um, in terms of your sample chapter, so you want to use the sample chapter as an opportunity to show off the best parts of your manuscript. So it should be between 10 to 40 pages. 40 is probably too much. You probably wanna go on the, so the shorter side. Um, it should not be a literature review. You're, you're, this is your opportunity to talk about you know, what's interesting, what's unique, not what has everyone before me done? What am I doing that's really interesting? Um, of course, you're gonna need a literature review for, you know, for your book, but in terms of the sample chapter, go straight to what's the most exciting, what's interesting, what's novel, what did you find? Don't start with, here's all the backgrounds because they'll never get to what's important. Um, think about it as exactly the opposite of a novel. If a novel, you need to wait till the very end, right? To find out what happens here, you want to tell them at the very beginning, here's what I've learned. Here's what's interesting. Here's what's you know, unique. Um, make sure that you use professional translation and editing services so that you're, you know, you come out clear and coherent. Otherwise, even if you think, oh, well, my English isn't bad and maybe I can get away without it. Um, it can influence the way that an editor, an acquisitions editor looks at your, at your manuscript and, and considers it. Um, doesn't have to be a full chapter. If you have 10 pages that but it does need to exist on its own, meaning don't send something which you have to understand what happened before and what happened after to understand this. That's not helpful. You want to send something that in theory is its own idea and can stand on its own. Um, uh, and, and, and finally, think a lot about your title, okay? Like we said before, if, if a publisher is getting five, six, seven, or an acquisitions editor is getting five, six, seven um, you know, uh, 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 submissions every day, you're going to want to catch their attention. Um, they may they may not even open up your file if you don't do a good enough job talking about um, it, like in your title and in your abstract or in something very short and sweet talking about the importance of your research. Um, so really be really think critically about your title. Does it convey the ideas inside? Is it interesting? Is it engaging? Is it understandable? Um, that's really important. Um, revisions, uh, arguably the most important part of writing. So make sure to show off the best part of your manuscript. So make sure that sample chapter and the rest of the prospectus is well-written. Um, make sure it undergoes a cultural edit. So what I mean by cultural edit is sometimes there are in certain you know, fields, let's say for example, quoting from a primary source. In certain languages, it could be okay to bring an entire page of, of primary source text. Whereas in English, Oftentimes, like that's much shorter. They don't want to see as much primary sources um, unless you're doing an annotated version of some sort of, you know, uh, text. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a, a, a typical manuscript um, or monograph. So make sure that it that it it it, it would appeal to your typical uh, editor who's going to be reading it. Um, share it with some colleagues to get some feedback. Get help from professional editors. Make sure that it's formatted and it looks good. Right, half the work when someone open up opens up a file is. Is it messy? Does it have track changes in it that haven't been clear, cleared up? You don't want to make making those decisions because it gives off the impression that it's not done professionally. Um, and if an acquisitions editor says, listen, this isn't, I, we're not going to accept this, ask them politely for feedback why, right? You'll learn a lot by doing that. Maybe they'll say, well, it's not written well enough yet. Or maybe they'll say it's not appropriate for our series, but maybe it is appropriate for a different series with a different publisher and you get some good ideas. So be polite, but ask them for feedback. So what's next? What's the next thing that you could do to make a tangible step um, to really start your book manuscript? So number one is um, submit an inquiry letter or proposal via email um, to an acquisitions editor. So start working on that proposal on that on that prospectus and 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 then start and make a short list of the publishers um, and then start sending to them. Um, also, don't just contact the publisher. Also, maybe contact the series editor because sometimes the series editor has influence on which books are accepted and which aren't, and they're also a good person to speak to. If you send off a letter and you don't get a reply, so first of all, follow up after a week with a polite reminder just to check in. Is it okay? Um, you know, just want to make sure you get this. If they're if if they're interested. So ask them what the next steps are going to be, what they want from you. Make sure that if it's going through peer review, you're patient and that you, you know, are, are, are ready to do some revisions. And if they're not interested, move on to the next publisher. The one thing I don't want you to do is sit by your desk or your phone or your office or your home and wait for an answer. It's going to be a process. You're going to need to work on other projects or continue writing your book in the meantime and be ready for that. Be ready for long delays. So 
follow up from time to time every few weeks um, just to check in, make sure everything's going well, but don't, don't be harsh and say, um, well, what's up? What, why, why have I not heard back on my project? Well, probably because the acquisitions editors have a lot of projects. The peer reviewers are inundated. They've got too much work and it's hard to, uh, for them to really help you at this current moment. Um, now, that being said, if you sent a manuscript off to a publisher and it's been a year and you haven't heard back, forget it, move on. Meaning like uh, you don't need to waste your career because they are inefficient. Finally, a little bit about academic language experts. Um, so first and foremost, uh, we provide language and publication support throughout the entire manuscript uh, journey. So feel free to be in touch with us about that. Um, uh, like we said, language, translation, editing, proofreading. Um, we had here before earlier in our meeting, uh, Dr. Ann Pavel, who's uh, currently the head of our German um, office. So if you do want to, if it's more comfortable for you to engage in German, translating from German, um, she, I can put you in touch with her. Um, you've got my email here in the back, so you can, um, you can shoot me an email and I can make that introduction with pleasure. Um, I also encourage everyone to check out our German website, um, which I'm putting here in the chat now, uh, which we worked quite hard on um, and, uh, and, and has all, a lot of our information um, that's available in English is also available in German. So you're welcome to check that out. Um, and, uh, and also uh, a link to Brill's uh, discounted uh, landing page. So if you go, if you are working on a Braille manuscript specifically, um, and you're going to submit to Braille, you'll actually get discounted pricing um, thanks to our partnership agreement with Braille, Braille Germany, um, any other Braille imprints. So you can do that. Um, follow me. Um, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn or, or reach out, connect on LinkedIn, or send me an email if you want to discuss anything further. Uh, I believe that brings us uh, to the end of our session today. Um, I do have a hard stop in about five minutes, but I am happy uh, if anyone has any uh, one or two questions uh, that they want to ask before uh, we end today, I'm more than happy to field your questions now. So uh, again, feel free to write in the chat or uh, to, to just open up your microphone and uh, contribute. In the meantime, I will put the partner um, link. So if anyone does want to learn more about how we work with Braille or, uh, or to actually upload a project for a quote, um, then you are more than welcome to do so. Out of curiosity, was I was I speaking too fast? Because I <laughs> was a is it was it were you able to understand? Thumbs up if you were able to understand. Good. Okay. Fantastic. I'm glad. I'm glad. Okay. Um, I, I I get I get very as you can tell I get very excited about these um, th this topic and uh, and and helping scholars with their research. So sometimes I I, I go too quickly. But anyway. All right, so thank you everyone again. Yeah, Gunther, were, were you trying to? Yeah, only a very short question or remark. I'm, I'm currently preparing a revised English edition of my habilitation thesis with Brill. Yeah. And uh, well, we have already made some preliminaries and I'm about translating the German text into English with the help of a native speaker, but well, anyway, if I'm, I'm not a native speaker, of course, and if I would like to ask some details concerning your, uh, well, your language service. Yeah. Okay. You want to I, I really think this manuscript needs editing. Yeah. Even if a native speaker has made some corrections or suggestions already. For sure. And it's important that it's not just a native English speaker, but also someone who has experience in your field, because yeah. when it comes to academia, there's a lot of specialized terminology. Each field, can exactly. be yeah. you know, so that's our, our company's sort of uh, added value is that we match you with a subject expert in your field who can really help you in a meaningful way. So is that, is that a, do you want to ask a specific question now, or do, would you like to make a time for afterwards, maybe to discuss your research more individually? Well, perhaps I, I, I may I may contact you afterwards for okay. some specific details. That's, that's... I don't think it's it's uh, necessary to discuss this publicly. Fine, got it. No problem. So we'll. Yeah, yeah, it's as simple as uh, just just shooting an email to Avi at aclang.com, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and then we can we can set a time to talk, and that goes not only for Gunther but also for anyone else who is here. Yeah. Um, really Very good. Project. Thank you. Uh, no problem. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And um, I look forward to uh, to being in touch and to seeing you at future events.
Oh, uh, Ilana, before we log off, uh, do we want to share? We've got another upcoming event uh, about how to, uh, uh, one minute here, and I will share if anyone's yes. interested. Um, For upcoming we've, events? Yeah, we've got another event coming yes. up, um, which I think would be really relevant to the folks link. here. Um, also with uh, Brill, but also with DeGreuter, it's more of a panel. Um, and we're going to be talking about how we're going to be going into more depth on how to make a list of publishers that are relevant for your research. So I'm going to throw that in here in the chat. Fine. And uh, and and you'll and and it's more of a panel, so you'll get perspectives of different publishers and how they recommend deciding which publisher is best for your research. So I uh, highly recommend to everyone to uh, to check that out and to and to register. If you can't make it on that day, you can always register and and receive a recording. So that's fine as well. Okay. And I'll just add as a reminder that we'll be sending out a recording of this conversation to everybody who's registered. So if you want to review a point here, we'll be able to very short. Yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. All right. Thank you, everybody. Take care now. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.